Greetings and good afternoon. My name is Anne Marie Lafasso, and I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development here at West Virginia University College of Law. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Constitution Day celebration and to introduce our speaker in honor of this day. But first, a few background words. On September 17, 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention held their final meeting at which they signed the United States Constitution. Since May 25th of that year, those delegates had gathered almost daily in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. Early in the process, the delegates realized that amending the Articles would be inadequate. Instead, they would need to create an entirely new document to establish a central government of limited and separate powers, reserving all other powers and rights to the states and to the people. The resulting document, Our Constitution, had seven articles. The first three articles define and limit the powers of the federal government and its three branches. Article 5 tells us how to amend the Constitution. Article 6 gives us the supremacy clause. And Article 7 tells us how to ratify the Constitution. That leaves Article 4, which relates to the states. Article 4 is famous for its full faith and credit clause and other clauses. But I'd like to briefly point out another clause that might be more relevant to today's talk. Article 4 contains the New States Clause, which I think is worth reading. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new states shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states are parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned, as well as of the Congress. This clause is interesting to anyone who knows the history of West Virginia statehood, which should be most everyone in this room since we just celebrated our state's sesquicentennial. I practiced that many times last night, that word. On April 17, 1861, Virginia seceded from the Union by a vote of 88 to 55. 30 of those 55 votes came from delegates of the future state of West Virginia. Later that year, West Virginia was formed. I am truly happy that everyone can be here for what I believe to be not only a profound look at some of the decisions made by Abraham Lincoln during his presidency affecting the Civil War, secession by the southern states, and West Virginia's separation from the state of Virginia and its Confederate principles, but a look at secession in general, the international law enabled, it enabled, and the effect it has have had on even today's current and global events. Professor Roger Billings has created, as some might say, a professional hobby in tracing and understanding the life and career of Abraham Lincoln, whom many, including I, considered to be our nation's greatest president. In addition to speaking to such various audiences at the, as the New York City Bar Association, the Filson H Historical Society, the Louisville Civil War Roundtable, and the Illinois Judges Association, Professor Billings has thoroughly navigated Lincoln's travels to and throughout the many Civil War battlefields. His recent book, Abraham Lincoln Esquire, The Legal Career of, a of America's Greatest President, published by the University Press of Kentucky in 2010, focuses on Lincoln's career in, study of, and dedication to the field of law. A University of Akron School of Law graduate and current member of the faculty of the Salmon P. Chase College of Law of Northern Kentucky University, Professor Billings has written several books about various legal aspects of the automobile industry and business transactions within the common market and Eastern Europe. He has often visited Munich, Germany, and the Russian People's Friendship University in Moscow as a participant in lawyer exchanges. He was designated as a Fulbright Distinguished Professor at the University of Salzburg, Austria in 2004, and has returned each year as a visiting professor with a focus in international trade law. It is therefore with great honor and appreciation that I ask you all to please help me to welcome our guest, Professor Roger Billings. Thank you, Dean LaFazzo, Dean McConnell, 
and other friends that I have gotten to meet in my brief visit here, Professors Bastris, Ellis, McLaughlin, thanks for welcoming me uh, back to West Virginia. I say back to West Virginia because I'm old enough to have been drafted into the Army. And guess where they stationed me? Fairmont, West Virginia. <laughs> so I fell in love with West Virginia during my two years uh, down the road and uh, spent some time in Morgantown when I was there, and that was uh, before some of you were born. And so I'm extremely happy to be back. Making two nations out of one nation is a nasty business. It starts with a secession, and it's seldom peaceful. If secession leads to a provisional government, then the next problem is recognition of that government. Sometimes when secession is followed by some form of recognition in international law, it's still not enough to create a new nation. In analyzing secession, we will use the Civil War as the prime example, and also the secession within a secession of West Virginia. Lacking much guidance from our own Supreme Court, we will see what the Supreme Court of Canada has said about the subject of secession and the legality of it. To analyze recognition, on the other hand, we will again use our own civil war, but will then conclude with the war between Kosovo and Serbia. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like if uh, we had had uh, the uh, uh, United States of the North and the Confederate States of America? Uh, had Lincoln recognized the CSA, he would have set up an embassy in the capital of Richmond, Virginia. He would have exchanged ambassadors with the CSA. He did that already with Russia and uh, Britain, France, the Austria-Hungarian Empire. He would have set up border checkpoints to stop trains and wagons to collect tariff on the imported goods from the north or into the north. Armed guards would be posted on the border. There would be no fugitive slave laws anymore that would allow slave masters to chase runaways into the north and fetch them back. That would be one good thing about the split up. There would continue to be a steady stream of runaways, but the Underground Railroad would no longer be needed to protect uh, the runaways after they reached the north. On the other hand, the south would do all it could to stop runaways at the border they would maintain a large number of border guards. They would watch the Ohio River carefully, where I live, looking for small boats coming across. They wanted no more Elizas of Uncle, Uncle Tom Cabin's fame. You remember Eliza came across the Ohio River on the frozen ice, and that's how she was able to make it over to Ohio. They would routinely check all the wagons crossing bridges, like the suspension bridge from Covington, Kentucky to Cincinnati, the scene at that bridge would be something like the scene at Checkpoint Charlie during the Cold War. Some of you have seen it, maybe. Do you remember the dramatic escape attempts, people hiding under cars, other people climbing the walls and running across no man's land, some of them getting shot? Expect similar things to happen at the border between the South and the North. Every week you would hear shots ring out from the Southern side. Yep, another slave was trying to escape. Now, if you were white, you would have to apply for a passport before trying to move across the border. The southern border guards would have an up-to-date list of abolitionists who would be denied entry into the south. Now, that's just the peaceful scenario. The second scenario is that the Confederate decides to fight a war of secession. Well, of course, that's what happened. Lincoln had two policy reasons why the south should not be allowed to secede. And one, he said, the Declaration of Independence is the last best hope on earth. We have to preserve it. And secondly, if the Confederacy became a separate nation, the slaves would be trapped in the South, and the hope for gradual emancipation would be dashed. Instead, slavery would spread, and Lincoln thought it would spread to Cuba and Mexico. He saw nothing in the U.S. Constitution that permitted secession. The South saw nothing in the Constitution that prohibited it. Years later, the Canadian Supreme Court gave the first reasoned opinion in the Quebec secession controversy that I know of from a democracy facing secession. And I will discuss this opinion 
uh, as it's the only court that we have that can tell us some insight. The Quebec controversy began in 1603 when the French settled Quebec and called it New France. For 150 years, things were relatively peaceful, but the French always felt oppressed. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, for example, their feeling that they were a minority up there was enough to attract the Confederates to set up a, an office in Montreal, the Confederate States of America office in Montreal, Canada. Well, during the, uh, the intervening years, the unrest continued till we come to 1967 when Charles de Gaulle came to Quebec. And at the end of a speech in Quebec, he poured oil on the fire. He said, with the concluding words, Vive le Québec! Vive le Québec! Vive liberté! Well, that was enough to ignite separatism anew. And then in 1995, they had brought it to the point where it was put to a referendum for the second time, actually. The first time failed, and the second time failed, too. 49.4% voted for secession. The governor then asked the Supreme Court of Canada for a ruling whether secession was constitutional. Lincoln would have been pleased with the result. Quote, secession of a province from Canada must be considered in legal terms to require an amendment to the Constitution. Now, this echoes what the U.S. Supreme Court said in Texas versus White in 1968. I'm sorry, 1868. Decision, the decision uh, uh, that they gave was one that Lincoln would like to have read but never lived to read, of course, and uh, a part of the decision reads, when Texas became one of the United States, she entered into an indissoluble relation. The union between Texas and other states was, was as complete, as perpetual, and as indissoluble as the union between the original states. There was no place for reconsideration or revocation except through revolution and through consent of the states. But during the war, no one had the benefit of that opinion, White versus Texas. Uh, let's take a look at some arguments for and against secession that were used on both sides of, uh, of the Mason-Dixon line. Northern lawyers argued that the Constitution prohibits a state from entering into any agreement or compact with another state without the consent of Congress. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 and 3. Two Supreme Court cases interpreted this as rendering the Confederate States of America an illegal government. Southern lawyers, for their part, answered, these prohibitions applied to the states only while they remained in the Union, and they did not prevent withdrawal. Another argument of the South is reflected in international law the ordinance of the state of Virginia that ratified the Constitution said, quote, we, the delegates of the people of Virginia, declare that the powers granted under the Constitution being derived from the people of the United States may be resumed by them whenever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression. I'm going to reread that since I interrupted it. The powers granted under the Constitution, being derived from the people of the United States, may be resumed by them whenever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression. Believe it or not, several other states have similar language in their ratification ordinance. New York, for one, I believe, surprisingly. At the time of the Civil War, the South raised the oppression argument. This was similar to the reasons the Canadian Supreme Court gave as justification for secession. <clears throat> that court said, <clears throat> international law does not specifically grant component parts of a sovereign state the right to secede unilaterally from the parent state. International law contains neither a right of unilateral secession nor an explicit denial of the right. The international law right of self-determination only generates, at best, a right to external self-determination in situations of former colonies where a people is oppressed, echoing the southern complaint. Now, the West Virginia situation, 
West Virginia resulted from a secession within a secession. It's hard to find a similar secession today, but I know of at least one. Uh, the secession of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia, from Georgia, and I don't mean Georgia of Atlanta, Georgia. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Georgia became an independent nation. Then Moscow decided, not too long ago, to send troops into South Ossetia and Abkhazia and to force a separation from Georgia, presumably because a lot of Russians lived in that region and they wanted to protect them. It reminds me of George McClellan's early victory over the Confederates in the western part of Virginia in 1861. After that victory, the South was never strong enough to challenge the North's possession of western Virginia. Similarly, Georgia today is not strong enough to challenge Russia's occupation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And now Russia recognizes them just like the North recognized West Virginia. West Virginia's secession was different from the secessions in Georgia. The biggest difference was that Virginia's secession and later West Virginia's secession within a secession took place under one constitution. West Virginia's secession posed special problems of constitutional nature. First, a new state carved out of an old state contradicts the Philadelphia Convention's obsession with the rule of equal state representation in the Senate. If big states could somehow convince Congress to agree, couldn't they deal themselves more senators by simply dividing into smaller states? Imagine Utah today dividing into four, north, south, east, and west Utah, multiplying the number of conservative senators by four. Well, also think about California, which even today is talking about splitting into two states, northern and southern California, uh, dividing the number of liberal, liberal senators into by uh, multiplying them by two. Uh, I'd like to see what the Constitution says about admission of West Virginia, if anything. And I quote Anne, uh, Professor Lafazo, Dean Lafazo said what the Constitution said. May I reread it? New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, semicolon. Nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. The first thing, and a big law review article 10 years ago was written about this, the first thing to note without my spending any time discussing it is the semicolon, which seems to say no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, semicolon. They said that's a period. Lots of, lots of ink spilled on that one. This is U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 1, by the way. Now, the writers of that 2002 Law Review article published in the Berkeley uh, Law Review, uh, California Law Review, uh, put it this way, I quote, <clears throat> Brace yourselves for this one, Mountaineers. West Virginia might not legitimately be a state of the Union, but a mere Ill illegal breakaway province. In the summer of 1861, following the outbreak of Civil War, 35 counties of Virginia, west of the Shenandoah Valley, north of the Kanawha River, met in convention at Wheeling to consider seceding from Virginia. In short order, the Wheeling Convention declared itself the official, lawful, loyal government of Virginia and organized a proposed new state, West Virginia. Then, in, which, in what must certainly rank as one of the great constitutional legal fictions of all time, the legislature of this Virginia at Wheeling and the proposed government of the new state of West Virginia at Wheeling, with the approval of Congress, agreed to the creation of a new state of West Virginia at Wheeling thereby purporting to satisfy the requirements of Article 4, Section 3 that we just read. Could they do that? Congress had decided earlier that for the purposes of selecting Virginia's senators during the Civil War, the Wheeling legislature was the leg legislature of Virginia. Congress now accepted the principle that Virginia's legislature had given consent to the creation of Western Virginia or West Virginia 
The West Virginia bill passed 23 to 17 in the Senate, 96 to 55 in the, in the House. The bill was sent to President Lincoln December 1862. Historians have noted that Lincoln was reticent about West Virginia's statehood. He asked for advice from his cabinet. They split 50-50. The conservative cabinet members, Bates, Wells, and Blair, were unwilling to swallow the legal fiction of Virginia's consent. The moderate wing of the cabinet, Seward, Chase, and Stanton, had no constitutional objections. Attorney General Bates was the early opponent of West Virginia statehood, and he described the West Virginia movement as an independent act of revolution. In contrast, the Secretary of State Seward said the Wheeling government was incontestably the state of Virginia. Um, but Lincoln was dependent, was never dependent on consensus in his, his decisions. Uh, he didn't care if they split 50-50. He formulated his own written opinion, which he reportedly read aloud to those cabinet members who were sitting there, some of them fuming and some of them happy. Um, the opinion focused on the question of the status of the Wheeling government as the legitimate government authorized to act on behalf of Virginia, and not at all on the fact that the same group of men had granted consent to themselves. He concluded his message that this was a purely wartime measure. He said, the division of a state is dreaded as a precedent, but a measure made expedient by war is no precedent for times of peace. It is said the admission of West Virginia is secession and tolerated only because it's our secession. Well, if we call it by that name, there is still a difference enough between secession against the Constitution and secession in favor of the Constitution. Final, final line, he said, I believe the admission of West Virginia into the Union is expedient. In other words, he would not have agreed to splitting up the state of, West Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia in peacetime. So the northern states recognized West Virginia, that word recognition. Some people believe recognition in the international sense was the greatest threat to the Union. Recognition in international law at the time of the Civil War had not progressed far enough to say one way or the other that the South had a right to secede. The rule of the jungle more or less prevailed. If you wanted to carve a new nation out of an old one, you'd better have an army to protect the seceding state, as the Army of Northern Virginia did for the Confederacy. If the new nation was lucky, international recognition would bring independence. In other words, a new state has two massive steps to achieve, secession enough to make them look like a nation, and secondly, recognition by everybody else to say, you are a nation. Simple as that. The Canadian Supreme Court said, the viability of a would-be state and international community depends as a practical matter upon recognition by other states. Recognition occurs only after a territorial unit has been successful as a political fact in achieving secession. International recognition worried Lincoln. A superb, uh, one of the things Lincoln did as president was to appoint a superb statesman, statesman named Charles Francis Adams as ambassador to Great Britain. He was already worried about foreign powers recognizing the Confederates. Great Britain in particular worried him because it was so powerful. If Britain recognized the South, he reasoned, other nations would follow. So in May 1861, uh, the British cabinet decided to grant the Confederate States of America recognition as belligerents. This was not full diplomatic recognition, but it was a good start. What it meant was Britain was neutral in the war and would recognize Confederate ships on the high seas. Furthermore, Confederate blockade runners would have the same privileges going to British ports as ships from the North would have in British ports. One thing Lincoln did not count on with the blockade was the possibility the South might gain full recognition. 
Full recognition would probably end the war. If the most powerful nation in the world asserted its right to trade with the South, then it would have been impossible to maintain a blockade. Britain would assert its right to trade with the South and North alike. Britain desperately needed the South's cotton. The war was causing economic distress in the mills at Manchester and other, other places in Britain. After full recognition, the blockade that prevented British ships from entering southern ports would be construed as an act of war. The United States has long been aware of the importance of recognition. In 1778, George Washington's army was struggling against the professional British army. France came forward to give provisional recognition to the colonies. This recognition was premature. The founding of the country was 12 years away. If you were betting Washington would beat the British, you'd better expect to lose your bet. But five years later at Yorktown, those same French helped Washington. They blockaded Yorktown, Virginia, and prevented General Cornwallis from escaping the peninsula by sea in British ships. Washington's army pinned Cornwallis against the Atlantic Ocean, and it surrendered. Um, the army, the, the large British army surrendered, Cornwallis' army. So in 1783, five years after the French provisionally recognized the colonies as independent, the British signed the Treaty of Paris, the colonies became independent. Now looking up to the Civil War, we see the British could play that role, or could have played that role in the Confederacy's fate, just as the French played that role for the revolutionaries in the war when our country was founded. The scene was set for a crisis at this time in the Civil War. Between the North and the Great Britain, uh, there was a lot of bad blood at that time. The Confederates decided to send two of their best statesmen to take advantage of this. They were on their way to Britain and France as commissioners. They were sort of going to be forerunners of ambassadors that the Confederates hoped they would become. They left Charleston on a blockade runner and arrived in Havana, Cuba to transfer to the British mail packet, the Trent, safely to go to Southampton. What happened next brought the U.S. to the brink of war. Almost. A United States warship, the USS San Jacinto, sent a shot across the Trent's bow on the high seas just after it left Havana. The purpose was to remove the two Confederate emissaries from the ship who were on their way to take care of Confederate business. And they were already past the Union blockade. They were in the open seas. The trouble here was that Captain Charles Wilkes of the San Jacinto had no orders to stop the ship, Trent. He searched the Trent, seized the emissaries, and imprisoned them in, Warren, um, in Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. According to David Donald, to remove the Confederate diplomats from a neutral vessel was a clear violation of international law, and it contradicted the long-established American opposition to such behavior on the, of search and seizure on the high seas. Most people in the North, however, were delighted to hear the Americans had twisted the British nose. They, they congratulated Abraham Lincoln, and Captain Wilkes was honored at receptions. He, Congress gave him a gold medal. The Secretary of Navy praised him. The British demanded Mason and Slidell's release and an, an apology. 8,000 British troops boarded transports for Canada in case of war. At this juncture, Lincoln received bad advice. Ignore the British. The British have no right to interfere with war between the states. But Lincoln knew the advice was wrong. There were well-recognized principles of international law that prohibited any country from interfering with the passage of any other country's ships on the high seas. The law was on Britain's side, and the United States had violated it. Should the British choose to make the most of the incident, it would mean war with the U.S. and full recognition of the Confederacy. At the last minute, Lincoln saw the disaster impending, and he overruled his advisors, and the Confederates were released to go on their way to Britain. But the British still were leaning toward recognition. Then came the bloody Battle of Antietam, and that slowed down the advocates of recognition. It looked like the North might win. And only when the Battle of Gettysburg was won in 1863 did the British advocates of uh, recognition back off, and Lincoln could breathe a sigh of relief. 
Recognition was a major factor then in the Civil War, and it remains a factor in war today. Thanks to the United Nations, we do have some guidelines for the first time. The Charter of the United Nations simply says, membership in the United Nations is open to all other peace-loving states which accept the obligations contained in the present charter and in the judgment of the organization are able to carry out those obligations. Well, that begs the question in the charter, what is a state? Yeah, we'll accept a state in membership. What's a state? Well, the first criterion, statehood then, uh, requires certain attributes to be examined, and believe it or not, the, uh, the attributes for statehood are still quoted from the Montevideo Convention of 1933 as the best criteria. A, a permanent population, B, a defined territory, C, a government, and D, capacity to enter into relations with other states. Personally, I add two more. You need to have an army to defend the borders, and secondly, you need to have a central bank. The European Union, you might say, has a central bank. The European Central Bank, it's called, and sure, that's a central bank. The trouble is it's just in name only. It's not a central bank, and that's what's causing all the problem in Europe today. And that's why the European Union is not itself close to being capable of recognition as a massive state like the United States of Europe. The ECB in Europe is not, it doesn't have the powers of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. There's nothing more sensitive then in international affairs than sovereignty and borders. The International Court of Justice ruled just as recently as July 2010 that Kosovo's Declaration of Independence did not violate international law, and that was a big statement of international law. It sounded good. Problem is, the court chickened out from a great opportunity they could have had to set the stage for recognition principles that we could all follow. They said nothing about recognition. They backed off. They were very timid. Well, that's all right, maybe. The international court's opinions are not binding on anybody. They're advisory, always. Uh, but it did encourage, that opinion did encourage NATO uh, in their diplomatic efforts to carve a new nation out of the former Serbia. NATO troops, 10,000 of them, stand ready today to keep the peace in Kosovo. NATO conducted a bombing campaign in 1999 to drive Serbian troops out of Kosovo. There were only 10% Serbians in Kosovo and 90% ethnic Albanians, and they were being oppressed. And made war on. Um, now, 10 years later, in September 2011, only 83 nations have given diplomatic recognition to the Republic of Kosovo, making it, which would make it an independent state. Problem is, there are over 100 nations that don't recognize Kosovo, and that includes Russia and most of the rest of the former Soviet Union that are now independent states. It includes Argentina, India, China, Brazil, Mexico. In fact, almost all of South America, Asia, and Africa refuses to recognize Kosovo. Legally, there is no magic number for United Nations membership, recognition of number of states to achieve membership. Uh, but anyway, if there were a lot of states recognizing Kosovo, it wouldn't happen in the United Nations. Uh, Russia and China have veto power, and the Security Council has got to accept the new nations, and they would veto Kosovo. So Kosovo is kind of in limbo. Uh, how far on the road to recognition is Kosovo if we take the United Nations criteria into account or if we take the Montevideo Convention into account? Here are a few indicators what's going on there. Only around 20 countries have established embassies there. Countries that don't recognize Kosovo won't facilitate imports from Kosovo. So trade is difficult between Kosovo and other nations. Kosovo does not have its own web IP address. It doesn't have an international postal code. It doesn't have an international telephone code. If you want to make a phone call from Kosovo, you have to go, you have to channel your phone call through Slovenia and Monaco at high cost. Kosovo athletes can't even join international sports associations. Kosovo borders are not protected by their own. They are only guaranteed by NATO troops, and so on and so on. Compare Kosovo with the Confederate States of America. 
The Confederate States had their own army, but they had practically no diplomatic contacts, although they tried really hard. Today, Kosovo is a laboratory for the international law of recognition. It illustrates perhaps how far we've come from the Civil War, but sadly, how little has been accomplished. Geopolitical reasons for recognition remain more important than the United Nations. When we finally establish a functional regime for recognition of states, we will be closer than ever to peace. The European Union's regime for recognition of new member states is the only example I know of with any promise. Meanwhile, the geopolitical path to recognition has best been summarized by the Canadian Supreme Court, and as you see, they added very little to it. That's all I have to say about the subject, but I'm delighted to be here and to, to perhaps answer questions for you. And I hope that uh, you have some. <laughs> Sir. So what I want to see is a big line of people in front of the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Um, good question. A lot of people have asked that type of question. He said, well, how much as a lawyer was he propelled to being a statesman, his lawyer? And, and if you look at his Illinois legal experience, it, it had almost zero contact with foreign, um, foreign law, international law. Um, he, was, he had an inquiring mind, so he was not ignorant entirely. He just wasn't practiced. Uh, now, some people don't realize that Lincoln had a practically a um, – uh, perfect memory, when you call it uh, photographic memory. He had nearly a photographic memory. And um, therefore, he, he read voraciously and he knew something, but he didn't have any experience um, in interpreting the Constitution. Uh, you know, he had, he had constantly talked about the Constitution in the context of slavery. He was pretty good at that. Uh, if that's what you mean, uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, of course, brought out lots and lots of his uh, constitutional analysis. The Cooper Union Address, what he did was he studied uh, every book he could get his hands on, taught himself more about uh, the founding fathers uh, than most people today, even scholars do. He, was, he blew them away in Cooper's Union by his knowledge of the Constitution as it was originally intended. So. If, if that's what you mean by did he have um, legal training to handle the problems in the Civil War of the Constitution, separation, and so forth, yeah, he was about as good as many others, but um, it was lacking his breadth of international training. He, he didn't – what was brilliant about Lincoln was his common sense was so broad and so deep that he was able to handle international problems of uh, recognition – which, of course, as I said, is closely related to secession, he was able to handle these problems better than his cabinet. And Seward just really didn't look better than Lincoln. If you read, if you see what Seward was advising Lincoln to do, and Lincoln would think, and he would think, and he'd read a few little bit, he came up to have a better reasoned opinion, a better reasoned opinion on almost all the issues, in my opinion, than all the wise people around him. Um, and he, he was a fast study. So yes, he had constitutional background, but it was fairly narrow. He had no international law background, and he was so astute that he was able to make up for it. I don't know if that helped or not. 
Uh, good question. Oh, of course, West Virginia staying in the Union, there was nothing to stay in the Union with. They were just a bunch of counties of Virginia. Uh, but you're right, of course, they did make themselves a state. Uh, let's see if I follow you. Um, the legal, uh, it was all done with a legal fiction of the certain counties in West Virginia, in the western part of Virginia, the bulk of who, uh, whose inhabitants did not feel comfortable with the gendered, uh, landed gentry, did not feel comfortable with slavery, uh, just lived a different life among the mountains. These people felt uh, more northern. Not all of them. Was, well, so they, they pretended, of course, that they were Virginia. The whole thing depends upon a pretense that counties that were not the state were Virginia. Is that where I'm coming from? Yeah, and that's why I guess I'm coming from the, uh, the, so the, the other angle, which is so why is West Virginia not Virginia and Virginia not Eastern Virginia? Ah. You see? <laughs> yeah. like, well, they, they could have renamed themselves Eastern Virginia. It would have been fine. But I guess in saying, I'm sorry if it's not, I'm, I'm, it's difficult, but what I'm saying is that why wouldn't, why didn't someone try to, um, not, I mean, obviously, historically, this didn't happen, but what is wrong with the logic of trying to pull, of saying, look, we're the legitimate Virginia? After the war. Yeah. That's, and a, great, so that's a great question. Great you, question. You I, can be another state if you want, but we are the legitimate Virginia. And so when the Civil War was over, yeah, yeah right. right? That's okay. great. And, and I don't think, I, I don't know if, if one of my... And so the Law Review article is wrong, that it's not the mountaineers who are illegal, but it's the state of Virginia that's illegal. Right? <laughs> right? Okay, let's put it this way. After the Civil War, somebody, and somebody can tell me what the answer to because I don't know the precise mechanism. Somebody said... The old state of Virginia is welcome home. The old state of Virginia. But unfortunately, the western part of it is not welcome home in the sense that they're, co they're coming home from the Civil War because they always were with us. So we're going to leave them the way they are. And the rest of Virginia that is, does not, is outside the borders of western Virginia or West Virginia, the rest of Virginia is welcome home. Um, who made uh, the, the decision that the Wheeling government was not going to take over the whole state again? That's what I think you're asking. Why That's didn't, part of it. Why didn't the Wheeling government become the only government of Virginia? And if that couldn't work out, why not then the Wheeling government is the government of Virginia and the Richmond is the government of whatever they want to call themselves, Jefferson? You mean or, we, on a copyright or a trademark basis we should deny them the use of the name Virginia? I agree. I, yeah. They got, they got away Absolutely. with murder. Yeah, they did. They got away with a lot. Should, should, should have called them the, so. Nor the, the state of Norfolk. That's what would have done, wouldn't it? That would have condemned them. That's a good, great question. Great question. I hadn't thought about it. So somebody must know out there, but I don't know. Uh, talk afterward. Um, I did a paper on this subject in undergrad, and if I recall correctly, after West Virginia separated, they actually established a northern recognized state government of Virginia in Alexandria. And I'm wondering if they had done that prior to the, uh, you know, if they had done that concurrent with the Wheeling government, if they could have avoided that um, supposed constitutional obstacle. Uh, um, there, there, um, you, you know more than I do about this, believe me. Here's what little I recall from reading uh, David Donald's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, J.G. Randall's uh, Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln, which I recommend. Um, Mr. Pierpont, who was the first governor of West Virginia, as I understand, repaired to Alexandria and set up an office there and stayed there most of the war. Am I right? I believe that's right, yeah. And he was, after all, the elected governor back at Wheeling, so all he did was remove his office nearer to Washington. Right. So, uh, technically speaking, uh, he was just... Uh, in, in putting his office in an old part of the original state of Virginia that had seceded, but was now conquered right. by the North. I have no idea whether we, he, he ever tried. And maybe, did he try to claim that the whole state of Virginia was now part of West Virginia? Well, he was the you know, provisional governor elected by the, uh, the, Wheeling, uh, the Wheeling Conference or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the actual first government elected under the West Virginia Constitution was Arthur Borman, I think. So, you know, it's kind of a separate, you know, I, I don't know if I'm convinced 
that, you know, the, the Wheeling government wasn't actually, you know, uh, didn't purport to actually be the whole state of Virginia, you know, the way that it panned out. But I, I don't know, it seems like the, there's not a whole ton of documentation about it. Uh, apparently not, but uh, apparently you found what there is, and uh, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you saved it, and if you did, would you like my card? Send it to me. <laughs> and anybody else? I wonder if you could talk about how the secession of West Virginia and the North's reception of it into the Union played internationally, and if it um, diminished, especially with Great Britain, I could see that as a rationale to say, well, we can move closer to recognizing the South because the North is no longer playing fair. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if it, it led into any repercussions with the recognition of the South as a nation. That's, that's a good question. She, she's asking the good question as to whether or not West Virginia caused a ripple in international affairs and maybe even pushed the, um, the French and the British uh, away from the North because um, it was such a rump a rump session that created West Virginia. Um, you know, I, I, there is a there is a book that I've been meaning. It's on my you know kind of on my table to read someday when I have about five weeks uninterrupted. Big book of everything the British did during the war, back you know back offices, what the prime minister said, and all this and that. I didn't read that yet, so I don't know whether they ever mentioned West Virginia. That's where you want to go. But here's what I understand from trying to find, as I do in my own collection of books, trying to find information about West Virginia. Here's uh, you know, the books of biographies of Lincoln, biographies of the uh, Constitution, the Civil War, um, everything about the Civil War. I hate to say it, but West Virginia pulled this off with a minimum of publicity. And um, I got, I really, uh, even the historians snub us here in this little corner of the country. They, they just don't pay much attention. It's kind of a backwater event that did not directly contribute much to the war whatsoever. If there hadn't been this new state of West Virginia formed, um, what uh, would have happened is the state would still have been in Union hands and just been an occupied territory. That's all. And it would have been a total comfortable occupation. There would have been no problem with, you know, those situations where uh, there was sabotage of the troops and the, behind the, Ameri the lines in the south and so forth. Nothing like that because the people were mostly pro-union. There is a story, if you want to look at it, of problems with some southerners in West Virginia. Now, there is a story there, a backstory. But by and large, it was not a big deal for the union. Once McClellan cleared out the Confederate army, um, they forgot about it. And, oh, you want to be a state? Okay. And then Lincoln wasn't sure. Eh, I don't know if this is a good idea. But finally, he said, and I didn't read this part of his message, he says, well, what we got here is at least one more state that's not slavery, not slave state. Then, well, that's, that's good enough reason. That's good enough reason. We took that out of slavery. But... Uh, he said in his message, uh, I, it's a good point. I don't know why he said that. I, I can find it for you. I'll, I'll see what you think. I mean, Kentucky was, Missouri, there's still slave states during the war. Yeah. 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 Was that a condition? Thank you. So um, it was, uh, what you're saying is that there were slaves in the hands of citizens, and that's important to, to note. <laughs> Um, if it was admitted as a free state, I don't know what happened to the very few slaves that had been held. They were emancipated by the admission of West Virginia. Do you know how many it was? Small number. I seem to recall, and you may have mentioned this, if, I, if you did, I'm sorry, that the real politic uh, reason for the formation of the state was the, the railroad line through the northern part of the state and Lincoln's requirement to keep that railroad um, from Baltimore through over to um, the Ohio River for the, Western, to Cincinnati. for the Western campaign. Yeah. And, and Wheeling, of course, was a major center. And by that time, oil and gas had been, uh, oil had been discovered around Parkersburg and was used to grease the railroad uh, machinery and equipment. So I think if anything persuaded Lincoln, in, a, in addition to his own 
legal thoughts. It was the fact that to win the war, he might have to have Western Virginia. That is a great addition to my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. So there was an actual logistical justification in Lincoln's strategic justification for West Virginia being, shall we say, carved out and protected strongly, uh, even to the point of making it a state that would get full protection of the Union Army. Yeah, whatever it took. Um, anybody else? I want to play a game with you in conclusion for fun. I want to ask you all about uh, uh, four, uh, I'll give you four names, and I want to ask you if you can tell me uh, which of these is not a nation state. I'll start out Slo Slobovia, Slovenia, Slavonia, Slovakia. Which one is not a nation state? Slavonia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Slavovia. Those are, that's of course out of order the way I started with. I'll, I'll mix and match. <laughs> we want to put the cup, you know how there's four things, not three, three P's under the cup. Anybody want to guess? Slavovia. Ah, Slavovia is not a state. Absolutely. Most of you knew that probably. <laughs> there's one more. Aha. Uh -huh. There's a second one. The other one, he says, is Slavonia. You all agree with that? Okay. Is he right, folks? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's right on. But just for the fun, just for the fun of playing with this uh, little uh, game of peas under the cup, uh, <clears throat> Slavonia while it is not a nation state, is a huge province <clears throat> of, Slo of um, Croatia. Slavonia is the name of a region. And the way uh, secession is going in the world, I've identified maybe 20 or 30 uh, secessions of importance since World War II, some of them still going on. Um, Slavonia, you never know, may become a state, but it is a um, I mean, in Europe, it's a big deal. You want to go to vacation in Slavonia. Well, it's part of Croatia. Um, Slovakia, of course, is the result of splitting a nation in two. Czechoslovakia, you know that. Slovenia is also a nation that is a result of secession from the former Yugoslavia and from Serbia. They were the very first to get out of that communist consortium. So thank you very much. It's been great fun to be with you. Just one second. I just want to um, thank our, our guest speaker. And as in appreciation, I know some of you have to go to class, so feel free. Um, in appreciation, we do have a piece of glass made in West Virginia for you and your wife to share. Thank you. Thank you.